I don't know whether we're going to be joined by very many because uh, there's, uh, th there's quite a lot of competition, so I'm very grateful you all came. <laughs> uh, there have been about seven sessions altogether as we go through in parallel. Um, and uh, on our part, uh, we are four of us, as it's listed here, um, almost in the same order, but not quite. So I'm, I'm Peter Burnhill as, as Gail, and as Ted, and then Alan. So just to save the introductions, we're almost in the same order. And in terms of the session, we've got one stack of slides, and we're going to attempt um, some form of, we were thinking about it's like country dancing, because we'll get up and we'll move around and we'll join the partner and you'll come through. So we're going to attempt, we haven't had any practice. Uh, on this particular Asher, so we're going to start through. Um, so the, our theme is that of stewardship and um, of the digital scholarly record, in other words, what we produce of our scholarship and then what it is that we require as our scholarship. Um, so moving through, let's see whether it clicks. Um, moving through, yes. Uh, so this whole area was uh, a big topic for CNI and for the community in, in the States and in Canada, uh, but particularly in the States and the UK and Australia, uh, around about 2003 or so. Um, and what's interesting is that you had this sort of important statement, uh, e-journal archiving meets and bounds survey of the landscape, uh, which Anne Kenny played quite a significant role in, in moving that. Um, and she's recently given presentation at NASIC. And in that presentation, which I think went, um, you know, those who go to NASIG had picked it up, but many of us who didn't go to NASIG hadn't quite picked this up. And then there's, a, there's an article that she's published as well, uh, Building a Social Compact for Preserving E-Journals. So we're, we're going to be drawing on some of that as background, if you like, of a, of a driving force in, in Anne Kenny and that, and some of the principles that we should go in. But there's a lot of our own material we're doing. So essentially what you've got is, uh, is uh, people who are working around the Keeper's Registry and those who are working as part of the Keeper's organisations, uh, keeping the digital content of our, of our shelves. And to some extent, we, what we reckon is that there is an unintended consequence of the web. Um, that's, that's done in lots of different ways um, and we've got on our shelves or did used to have on our shelves um, uh, journals, uh, government publications, uh, newspapers, news media what you expected when you went into a leading research library that it would have that not every library had everything but in some sense we hope that everything was catered for in some ways by the research libraries uh, many of these research libraries are university-based research libraries, but other research libraries are around, national libraries and, and the rest. And there were collection management to make sure that there was not just the product of our scholarship, as I said, but there was material about what we could call our published heritage. Um, so inside that, that, what we had, and uh, we learned that um, after a while, this, this should click sensibly, and it disappears. And so what it recognised is that we then had of so-called boasting of e-collections, but in practice they were e-connections. Uh, libraries no longer have those e those collections of, of journals, of news media, of government docs as they used to be called. They're no longer on their shelves, so the question is, where are they? And part of what we've been talking about today is the efforts that have been made taking the actions and call to, to arms, if you like, that there was in 2003 to, to show how there has been some progress but also there are now some challenges and there's some things to be done, especially as we might broaden our focus from the scholarly literature into that literature that we want to make sure also is kept, from government publications, from news media, and to new forms as they are. Um, so um, in some ways it's therefore time to take stock. And we're going to divide our presentation into three groups essentially. It's, it's what do we know? and thinking about the task. Um, we're going to boast of some of our collective achievements, being yourselves as well as ourselves, <coughs> of what we actually have done. We've moved from the from ground zero, so to speak. But also the number of challenges which we present as amber alerts, things to just take note of. And there's going to be, in that, there's going to be a lot of statistics. So you know, just scribble away. Uh, but actually the, the presentation will be available afterwards and indeed there are some slides that we're not presenting because there won't be time and so they'll be in the stack to be able to download and, and the rest later on. Um, and then there's the next section really about what is to be done, um, so having described the, the problem and then ending up with in some sense 
something we're trying to open up, we're going to try and make sure we've got enough time uh, so that we can decide collectively to some extent on the priorities for our attention and our action. And it's deliberately this idea of priorities for our attention because there's a shortage of attention. But we've got to work out how you as research libraries, or we do collectively as, as the research world, we decide what we really care about and therefore those priorities need to be brought together, listed and shared and then we can act on those priorities for our attention and our resource effort is what we need to do. So there was a way in which we could reckon that the task in hand, you know, diagrammatically, is ease and continuing access to, to what we need to have for our staff and students and the rest of it. And so in some sense we know there's a world where it's, it's easier now, much easier to get hold of stuff than ever it was before. And, um, but there's this focus upon the long-term preservation and also the things just in case we need. So, you know, so in the case that it's not becomes available. So there's a blend there between long-term preservation but also, uh, if you like, persistent access if there are crashes in, <coughs> in servers belonging to publishers or whatever it is. So there's this mixture of things to be able to take account of. And, and obviously there are challenges to do with restricted and open and the license content and that way of breaking it up. Um, so there's a segue which we'll do here and begin to say how do we define our focus? So to begin with we have a focus of the stewardship of our scholarly record. Because if we as research libraries don't look after that, we can't expect the US Marines to do it. You know, there's a sense in which it's our responsibility individually as research libraries, of, of, of communities, of disciplines, and of countries, but then collectively that we've got this, this work to be done. So this is where we do our attempt at, a, at an elegant segue. And I, I stand up and that's where the ISSN uh, comes in because we were lucky to be uh, partici well to participate in, in this initiative right from, from the start, at, right at the inception of, of the project. And uh, as you know, uh, the ISSN has played a, a role, uh, a, a, the role of a linchpin uh, for transaction relating uh, um, to printed serials, but also to digital serials. And uh, we've been um, acting and, and, and thriving uh, for more than 40 years now. Uh, and uh, uh, what more is that uh, the international um, network of ISSN centers um, have been acting and identifying as well printed journals as well as digital serials, uh, but not only serials. Uh, as you, you can see here, uh, we also identify conference proceedings, uh, government publications, and so across the different national centers, these, um, these scholarly record or parts of this scholarly record are being identified. Um, what, we, what we can see here on, on this table is that uh, there was a massive increase uh, in e-serials over the past uh, 20 years. Uh, you have a few figures here um, dated, dating from 2009 until today, 20, 2017. And what we can see is that uh, there has been a, like a 60% increase in the production of digital serials. Uh, over these seven years, and we know that we will reach two, 200,000 uh, online serials by the end of, of this year. So this growth in, in online resources uh, has been a, a global experience, and that's why we've put in the, in the table a few figures for, for different, different countries pertaining uh, to the ISSN network. Oh, sorry. Um, and all centers are involved uh, in, in this process of identi identification. And here on this uh, map, you can see the percentage um, of, for example, uh, digital um, serials identified in Germany and how much that represents uh, over the global figure. Oops, sorry. One more. <coughs> Let me drive. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, what have we been doing um, as we, we move <coughs> forward to state the achievements uh, of the Keeper's Registry? Um, we've been uh, working with three different types of organizations, and some are 
well, most of them are really familiar to you. Uh, Clocks and Portico, of course, uh, which uh, depend on, on uh, publishers and also libraries to get uh, some titles ingested. Um, but also the nationals, or what we call the nationals, uh, which are organizations with a, a, a remit to cover uh, the, pu the, the publication in the national, over the national territory. Um, and also uh, some consortia or university-based uh, cooperatives uh, working in the same uh, field. Oops. Um, so there are at the moment uh, all these um, organizations involved in uh, the Keepers Registry and more are going to join and we're mentioning here uh, the Swiss National Library uh, which uh, at the moment uh, has expressed in it, its interest in, in joining the, the Keepers Registry. So what shall we do next? Uh, what are our main concerns with the preservation of uh, the scholarly, the digital scholarly record and the published heritage. Um, it is important uh, to have different uh, archiving organizations involved in the process because we know um, that in the past there were some uh, destructions and destructions of libraries, of course, material print or analogic material was destroyed at that time. Uh, we know also that uh, buildings or, or libraries such as, for example, the Bosnian National Library in, in Sarajevo uh, was destroyed. So there are, you know, um, kinds of um, catastrophes happening uh, everywhere. So that the reason why we need so many organizations involved and also different regulations uh, in these organizations to keep uh, our things, our material, our digital, digital record safe. But what is the problem? We know that something is happening here with, uh, regarding digital preservation, but what happened before the Keepers Registry existed is that we didn't know exactly uh, what, which material was uh, preserved or archived, and also to what extent uh, it was archived. So today, um, the Keepers Registry, uh, which is available at thekeepers.org, you have the the address there, um, is, is a kind of monitor for, is a global monitor for archiving e-journals, e-serials and the like. And uh, the, the, the main purpose of this service is to enable librarians, uh, policy makers and all people uh, concerned with this issue to discover who is looking after what. Um, so how can you do that? In fact, by using uh, this service, you can uh, upload a list of ISSN or of titles and find out which organization is keeping what and see also where you may encounter some uh, lacks or, or um, where some issues or some titles uh, lack. Uh, the secondary purpose of the Keepers Registry uh, is to be a showcase for the organizations uh, which archive our uh, digital, digital um, scholarly record. And uh, the idea is also to provide information on this organization at this single point of entry, so that if you want to uh, get contact or get in touch with them, you, can, you know where to, uh, where to find this information and then uh, contact them. Another purpose uh, is to generate um, statistics on the progress um, uh, being made to secure um, uh, our scholarly record. Uh, well, in some cases we, we have progress or we can see progress is, is made. In some others, um, regarding some titles, if you, if you look for, for titles, you can find that no progress is being made. So that's also a way to alert, alert uh, librarians uh, about this issue. Uh, so for example, uh, just one title we wanted to mention, but there are many, many more. So um, uh, the origins of life and the evolution of the biosphere, and you can see that. Um, here you have uh, both ISSN for the print version, the online version, uh, the publisher, and you can see 
uh, where this title is being preserved, uh, and we mentioned all the uh, organizations preserving this, this title, and also with the collection which is pre preserved. Okay. And uh, so you can see here also that often you get the point that not all the volumes are issued. So again, if you mm. take a library perspective, one wants to want to show that what volumes and issues are missing and who's got volume 47, for example. And so the maturity of cooperation between the keepers is something which we're looking towards so that we can do comparisons to find out where there are uh, missing runs and how that can be done. So that's part of just of showing that particular one where actually Springer uh, is well collected, as we'll see as we go along. Because what we then can do is just been touched upon is the fact that we can use the Keepers Register to generate data and evidence about progress of archiving. Um, and um, some good news. So we're going to start with some good news, uh, which is that um, over the last three years or so, the proportion of known titles to be archived has increased considerably. That's a mixture, therefore, of... Um, more archiving going on, but also we know about more archiving. We've had an increase in the number of those who keep digital shelves reporting in through the Keepers Register. So our ability collectively to know what's going on has increased, and this is like a good thing. We've still got some gaps, as has been said, so uh, some of the nationals that you'd expect to have, like the German National Library, the French National Library, uh, the Canadian Library and Archives in Canada, there are a number of big ones that we want to get in, but also what's going on in Italy and Spain, etc. So there are areas that we want to make progress, um, but the progress is nevertheless being made. So what we would then look on to think is that in that progress, can we come up with a couple of stats, some sort of... <coughs> key performance indicators, they're very fashionable. So this is where I get to reuse my Masters in Statistics to do some long division. Uh, and essentially it's the, uh, it's the number ingested divided by the number that could be ingested, and then the number ingested by three or more, which we've nicknamed the, keepers, uh, the, the keep safe ratio, uh, which in some sense measures this extent to which there's a robustness in the system. Lots of copies keep stuff safe or whatever but nevertheless multiple copies in different places, as has been shown. So eggs in one basket, so to speak. So if we began just by the, the total that's on the ISSN register, by what we know that, uh, to be kept, then this in some sense is a measure of progress we're making for the global published heritage, if you want such a phrase. So across the world, what we know, the ISSN has been assigned to that, and regardless of whether a government publication or news media, but certainly including a lot of the things we regard as scholarly resources. So what we need to do now is try and be a bit more precise. <coughs> so I'll go through it a bit of a canter. This you might have seen before if you've been interested in the subject, because this was where uh, we were approached by Columbia and Cornell, and then by Duke, and we did some statistical analysis, and this has been in, in some of the, uh, the uh, published literature. And what you can see, essentially, is that three quarters of the list of each library, which they thought to be important, was unknown as to whether or not it was being kept. Now, there's update on those stats, and there's a little bit better with some progress has been made, like it's now only two thirds not known. But still, it's a considerable list. And uh, the, the thing for all you all to note is that you can use the members area to upload a list of your own library of, of titles that you care about and you're subscribing to or you uh, are depending upon in some sense. You can do that inside the members area, just uploading it, and you can get back a report of which titles have been uh, uh, archived and by whom and which are not being archived. So you can do this yourself now. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do with the Keeper's Registry, is that we're producing some statistics about that and telling you about that, and that's all very fine, but we're shifting it round to do have this uh, like an observatory, <coughs> uh, a telescope, and you will have access to the data from that telescope, from that monitor. So you can do your own analysis, uh, what you care about, particularly for yourself, or whether you've got a more strategic view nationally or in terms of disciplines or in other areas of doing like that. So we're trying to improve the, the monitoring of that. Um, so another way of looking at it is what do our readers use? So we run a system in uh, the University of Edinburgh for the UK uh, with the Open URL router because there are different Open URL resolvers. There's a way in which you can go and we have a sort of table to know 
on the basis of the institutions of which resolve us. So we have a little roundabout that reroutes these these. Steps. So this is on the basis of, of four million of those requests, aggregating it using the ISSN up to the uh, 50,000 or so uh, titles. Um, and then there's the ingest ratio and the keep safe ratio. So those two sort of simple statistics, if you like. One being that are just less than half, 40%, <coughs> is being ingested by, in other words, 60% we don't know about. And the keep safe ratio, again, about a quarter. Um, so what we're trying to do is get measures that we can have about progress we want to make over time, a um, uh, robustness. So another one, which is um, looking at discipline, subject areas. Now, this is UK based, but um, we have a system in the UK in 2014, a research excellence framework. Before that was a research assessment exercise, and, and no doubt more and more uh, 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 places in Europe and otherwise are, are inventing these mechanisms to lead tables, compare one institution for another, and there's points mean prizes and you get more money if you get put in. So what happened here is that there are about 60 units of assessment where each institution put in to say, these are our best articles, these are our best books across the different things. And so they submitted those. And these, therefore, in some sense, are the elite journals, at least in terms of the ones being assessed. And typically what you can see is that the, um, the STEM journals were reasonably well archived. And um, so you can see they're into the 90s and whatever. Um, but actually, the arts and humanities are very much more at risk. So these are ones which you would expect to be well archived. Um, so there's a much longer tale of things where not being included as the journals that people want to be assessed in, because of course assessment led me. So this is another way of looking at it, is the variation by country of publication. And the thing to notice here is not just necessarily the amber alert to do with the fact that it's, uh, it's highly variable, as you can see it is highly variable. But in some senses, what's interesting is that the countries, Netherlands in particular, but the countries where there's a high ingest ratio is typically where there is a big publisher or a collection of big publishers. And in some sense, let us big a big shout out that actually the publishers are doing well. They're doing the right thing. Admittedly with your money, <laughs> but nevertheless they are doing the right thing. They are engaging with Portico, they're engaging with clocks, and in fact, many national libraries also try to engage with them because there are big numbers to be had if you invest in, in, in just them. So we go down there, Egypt, you know, I wonder, UK, 43. But actually, as you go down, it's still not that clever. It's still not very full. And if you rip on to look actually at the next one, which is the keepsake ratio, there's some concerns there too. Um, so this again is country by country. So to say to Canada, <coughs> uh, but also uh, other countries are available, <laughs> uh, the, the, the ingest ratio is pretty low. Uh, and, it's quite, and if you look at the keepsake ratio, that's really quite low. Um, so there's a lot of progress to be made in terms of amber uh, uh, alerts. What we did do earlier, and we haven't updated <coughs> it that much, um, is uh, the um, different types. Remember we had this category of the clocks and portico as one type and then the nationals and research co -ops. There's a sense in which they're all collecting the same sort of thing. And there's a worry, therefore, about what you could then move on to sort of is this long tail problem. Um, that the big publishers are being well collected but there's a long tail, and then some of our presentation next is going to be how do we look at that long tail and what progress can be made. So on that, I'll pass on to Ted. See if I can make <clears throat> the magic of the slides work. Um, just want to talk a little bit about um, when Peter's talking about the long tail, um, it is not strictly between, say, scholarly communications and what we call the published heritage. Um, but obviously, um, much of the scholarly record is taken care of by large publishers and the sort of non-scholarly record, which really is an important part of the published heritage. And at times, I tend to think of it as, uh, in many cases, is almost like the primary sources, not the academics talking to each other, but the raw material academics need to do to write the article in the first place that then turns up. Um, and that is a large part of the long, of the long tail. That's what we want to talk about here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about nationals and legal deposit. 
and then Alan can talk about research library co-ops uh, from our friends in the snowy north. Uh, so the first thing, the important thing about legal deposit is it does not care. It does not differentiate between scholarly, trade, personal, anything. It cares about is it, does it fall within sort of the, the law for that country and therefore anything within that and it really is scholarly trade personal. Um, the pictures I have here are three screenshots of part of uh, journals or serials let's say or periodicals that we are already obtaining through mandatory deposit in the US and we have an industry newsletter, we have an association uh, magazine and we have actually the a, a organization by I don't know, professional hobbyists, but in any case, it's a, it's a hobby magazine. But all of them are very important, and we're able to gap, gather all of them. Um, so there's a great advantage that, obviously, we're capturing the scholarly publication, but we also are already gathering the other aspects uh, of the publications within the United States. And one thing it does is it actually tends to give value there. Um, these, some of these things may not cost that much, though I don't think many people can afford polymer scan. It is very expensive, but some of the other ones are very cheap. Um, they're very cheap, they're very niche, and they're not academics talking to each other, um, but in and of themselves they're very important as well. And we do collect them. This has been happening in print for over a century. It is increasingly happening with electronic, and I think one of the values of the National Library and its remit over the publications of the nation and of legal deposit having the same thing is it does give that a premature. And we do find this, that it's the same reason people want their copyrighted materials sent to the National Library. They want us to have it, is because it does give that sort of value. And so this is, <coughs> this is very good, it's important, and it's a valuable way in which National Libraries and legal deposit can ensure that the published heritage is not forgotten as we look at the large beasts, but we work through the long tail. That is the, the good side. So uh, one thing I do want to say is the caveats. Um, there is a natural tendency to go for the low-hanging fruit. I'm talking about the, the small publishers, but of course, of course, we go after the scholarly publishers. That is a vast amount of very valuable material, and we get Springer, we get Taylor and Francis, and we're getting a lot of material. And you know what, when you're starting out with this, you really need to show them you can really punch hard. You get one of the big publishers and you say, this is not a minor part, this is a major part, and it is important part. It's how we've got up to, um, at this point, of all the serial issues we acquire annually through copyright, mandatory deposit, legal deposit, 10 to 15% are now electronic. It's ha that's how we're doing it, and so we do pursue that. And then the other thing inside the United States, and this depends nation to nation, is that it's not just from US publishers, it's widely distributed in the United States. So we can use this to capture the multinational model of the world. The picture up here, you probably can't see it, but at the bottom, the Rotslav Review of Law, Administration, and Economics is not part of the American published heritage, as far as I can tell. There are probably a whole bunch of Polish Americans who would say, yes, it is. <laughs> but still, this is something we're getting through legal deposit because it's still valuable to us. So we are not single-mindedly on the published heritage of the United States. It's an important part, but of course, it is also fighting for limited resources. With the scholarly publications, we can acquire this way. Um, and then there are just the general challenges, and I don't think these are shocking to anyone, um, but I do want to talk briefly about the legal situation. At the high level, the law is very nation by nation, and you can't see it, but that's a wonderful little shot in on the Holy Roman Empire during its, its really decayed stage, when you walk 10 feet and suddenly you'd be in another minor principality. It still feels like that sometimes. In a lot of these cases, and in each case, it's sort of a high-profile, delicate negotiation, trust me, because we're doing it again in the US, is working this out and engaging with them. And the funny thing is, we're often talking to the same large multinationals, we're talking to this, a lot of the same people, but it's a different political environment, it's a different legal environment, it can be a different cultural environment, and so each time, libraries want the same thing, publishers sort of want the same thing, but we're talking in, in very different ways, and so it's very, it's very difficult to get what would be easier if we all just sat down together and we all came to sort of agreements, but it is, since it is nation by nation, that is very hard, if not impossible, and it is one of the challenges, is that 
legal deposit, another challenge is that it is very difficult to know what the legal deposit is unless you look country by country and do research on them. There's no place that we could find, and maybe somebody has it, and if you do, please tell me, um, that tells what it is. I've seen things recently, one from 2014, and even that's out of date in parts. It's a rapidly moving situation. Um, sometimes the laws have to be changed, sometimes it's regulation has to be changed. It's very, very difficult to know what is out there. So everything is a little uncertain. Legal deposits are very useful, but it's so fluid and it's so dependent upon the nation. And then, of course, technically, we've let a thousand flowers bloom, which is wonderful, it's beautiful. Um, it means a large number of individual publishers, especially for the small publications, especially published heritage, that long tail. We've got a lot of flower picking. The great thing about the big ones is they can give us the material in bulk, and we love it, and they give us wonderful metadata, and we love that even more. And the small publishers, we can't do. I was just talking to someone, this is, this is an old thing I say, is that I need to know, show me how much the technology can get me to a certain point. When the return on investment needs to flatten out, then I'll know what people have to throw at managing this. But we expect that this is where libraries are going to have to do more work is and the little guys, the guys that can't do the metadata, the guys that don't understand this, and we are going to have to reach out to them, make it easy for them to get us the stuff, make it easy for them to even do basic metadata. But it's going to be a lot of more effort on our part. And this is, this is where, if we can get the scholarly publishers under control and do that in a very simple way, this is where we think most of resources are going to go. And it's going to be a lot of resources. But there's valuable uh, publications out there. There's at least one, and I've heard many other people have the same situation, but one of our um, scholarly open access journals um, a year ago stopped adding new content and the publisher put up a thing saying we're not getting new content we're going to stop publication a few years on board of this I'm taking down the website but we've got it we've got the whole thing but I don't know if anyone else does and when he takes down that and the website goes away this is 10 years worth of good scholarly publication by good wow, academics and it could be gone so So the impact of legal deposit in general, it is difficult to tell. Uh, potentially there's a lot, but it's very difficult to tell because one, as I said, we don't really know how broadly it is either allowed, what the scope then is, and how it's actually rolling out. Um, in the US, it's only if it's online only do you get it, unless we've made a deal with them to get electronic in lieu of print, which is up to the publishers if they want to go this way. Um, so not all nations have it, as far as we know. Uh, and even when they do, it is a slow business. Even getting the big publishers, it takes effort to get that stuff in. Um, and then very fewer keepers. So we, even if they are a national library, who is using legal deposit to collect your published heritage? We don't know what you're getting. Uh, right now there are the five up here, which are keepers. And I think the goal is to get more on board, to, to show our colleagues at other national libraries that they can be cool too. They can join us. Um, there is a real value in legal deposits. So after having done the challenges, having done the caveats, there is a real value. It's been useful in collecting print. It's increasingly useful in collecting electronic. We have materials that might not be collected otherwise, that um, other areas which need to focus on the scholarly journals and scholarly communication, the scholarly record, have to focus on first, and we understand that. Um, but legal deposit allows us to expand out from there, and it will be useful. I think the important thing is, though, and I don't think anyone thinks this, but it's good to drive it home. Legal deposit is not silver bullet. It's not, it is an important tool. It's not the whole toolbox. <coughs> Which I hope is a nice segue to my colleague. So please let me know if you can't hear me. I tend to speak to my slides. They've never spoken back yet, but um, <laughs> I think that's probably a good thing. Um, I'm uh, uh, going to be talking to you about uh, uh, initiatives at, uh, uh, within the context of a regional library consortia. Quite different from the legal deposit context and even very different from uh, services that on the surface have a similarity such as Portico and uh, clocks which operate at, a, at, a, at a, a, a quite a different level. Um, the consortium I work for is the Ontario Council of University Libraries. So. Uh, we're a consortium of about uh, 21 academic libraries in the province of Ontario, representing about 450,000 uh, uh, FTE students. 
wide variety in the sizes of the institutions from schools under 5,000 to schools uh, close to 80,000. And uh, one of the uh, key elements uh, is that all of the services, including Scholars Portal, uh, uh, supported by OCL are support fully funded by our member fees. So we're not, uh, uh, we, we're not reliant on uh, publishers uh, for uh, additional funding to support our preservation activities. It also means that all members are active in, a, in, pre in preservation activities, whether they're a small school at the 5,000 level or the very biggest research library. So um, the, in, um, uh, the key uh, uh, fact about our, our solution or our approach to digital preservation of uh, electronic journals is that what we focus on is collecting the material that OCL members have acquired through purchase principally um, from um, a, a variety of subscription agreements, either at the uh, provincial level or at the national level. And um, the way we've been able to do this is by uh, working really hard to build into our local loading agreements uh, three critical rights, um, local loading and uh, uh, a, a right for us to be able to take content from a publisher, uh, load it onto a local platform, and serve it up, uh, serve it up to our members um, who have uh, subscriptions to that content. So it's an open, bright, uh, bright archive. Uh, we also secure post-cancellation rights for the material that we load on the platform, meaning that if a school chooses to cancel its subscription of uh, an entire uh, package or one or more titles, they continue to have access to what they purchased on our platform. And then finally, we've also secured from the publishers what we call transformation rights, which basically give us the right to be able to uh, uh, modify and transform their content into new formats over time as, uh, as a technology becomes obsolescent and the, the material needs to be refreshed. So um, Scholars Portal uh, is a technology service of OCL and, uh, and runs both our journals platform and what we what, uh, refer to as our trusted digital repository, our TDR. So the TDR was audited by CRL in uh, 2012, and um, it again emphasizing it's about library-based governance. Uh, we preserve what our members collect. It's an open or bright archive model, and it provides seamless uh, post-cancellation access. So very different than the legal deposit model, very different than Portico, um, uh, something that's really focused on working libraries. So um, I want to talk about, uh, now switch tax here, and just talk a bit about uh, the, the nature of scholarly publishing in Canada. And I'm going to use this, uh, uh, this uh, very simplified scheme. It's going to be a very simplified view. But when we're looking at serial publications, they really break down into uh, four, four major quadrants. Uh, big international journals, uh, national, what we call <coughs> national or regional journals, open access journals, and there's a lot of overlap between national and open access, and government serial publications. So some of those large uh, serial registration numbers that we saw for Canada, in fact, reside in this uh, fourth quarter where uh, there's a lot of uh, publication of government serials that have been registered with, with ISSNs. So um, in terms of uh, uh, the Canadian, uh, schol uh, Canadian scholarship, and this is probably true of many small countries. Most of our STEM-based scholarship, the science and technology <coughs> scholarship, is, and with, with some exceptions, of course, is published in big international journals. So we acquire these from uh, the, the large publishers through big deals. Uh, they're very high-cost journals. And so um, the, uh, uh, the um, rationale for uh, collecting them is, is very easy to make within uh, a simple risk management context. We paid all this money for it. We should be able to secure access to that going forward. Um, so the challenges we face there really are uh, this, uh, challenges around negotiating rights to the material. So uh, while this is often described as the low-hanging fruit of preservation, uh, sometimes you have to tug really hard at that fruit to get it out of the hands of the publishers and into your own platform. So it's not, not always that easy, as uh, Ted was mentioning. 
uh, quality assurance and, and managing a system at scale, particularly for a small regional consortia are, cr are critical issues. <coughs> The national journals, however, are, are uh, <coughs> really where uh, what we think of as Canadian scholarship uh, in, a, in a local sense resides. So these tend to be uh, in, the, in the arts and humanities area. They're very low cost but high value journals in the sense that they're unique and not, uh, not generally preserved outside of Canada. Um, and um, there are very small number of journals, but with a very large number of publishers. So the patterns you see in international publishing with concentration in a few large publishers, it's the exact opposite in a national context, where you have many, many uh, organizations involved in publication. Another key fact is that they have a much higher rate of cessation than international journals. So one of the key challenges in tracking down these uh, types of journals for preservation is that uh, by the time you uh, identify them and go after them, they can often be out of business. Um, open access journals have a lot in common with national journals. And in fact, uh, a lot of the national journal publication in Canada, especially in English Canada, is switching over to an open access model. And this makes a lot of sense because these, uh, ten, these arts and humanities journals tend to be low cost journals and they fit the open access uh, uh, financial model quite easily and they can make that transition quite easily. Um, there are, are except uh, the, the downside of that however is that um, while we have a lot of a burgeoning uh, array of open access journals again there's a, and a low co cost, uh, uh, low barrier cost to publication there's many many new journals often outside bibliographic control uh, high rates of cessation and, the, and the, to be frank, the people who are pr producing them are really focused on publication rather than preservation issues. They're really interested in getting the research out, not thinking much about the preservation side of things. Finally, on the government serial side of, of things, there have been real uh, significant challenges in this space uh, with the uh, demise of the old uh, print-based uh, uh, depository programs. So with the rise of electronic publishing in government, there's been a strong focus to move away from maintaining uh, historical or archival back copies of material and really focusing on the content that's applicable to the government of the day for the situation of the day. So there's a real danger, uh, we've, we're seeing a, facing a real danger of these uh, critical publications uh, going lost. So, um, the Library, uh, Ar Library and Archives Canada has a role through its Depository Services Program uh, to uh, attempt uh, to, to create web archives of this. But at the same time that the, the switch was happening, they were also losing funding and so creating huge gaps. Now some of that's uh, been addressed, but uh, there's still a, a strong issue around fugitive publications that are following outside the archiving programs. So in Canada, our, our current situation really is uh, a loosely coupled uh, a network of different preservation in initiatives. And generally it speaks to, I think, one of the key messages of the Keeper's Registry uh, that, that no single solution fits all types of material or um, all types of national situations. So on the international side, Scholars Portal has a really good handle on that uh, for most, most schools. We, of over 13,700 journals, still tracking down others, but we have a mechanism in place for that, and we have plans for scaling using, uh, scaling out, uh, potentially uh, uh, becoming a, a national uh, preservation service under the aegis of the uh, Canadian National Research Network. Um, on the uh, national side, there's strong support uh, regionally for uh, journals through AIRUD, which is a Quebec-based uh, uh, organization, which has really uh, made great efforts in uh, uh, both supporting publication but pres also preservation of, uh, of national journals uh, from, from, from Quebec and is trying to build bridges with, with English Canada to provide those services as well. Uh, for open access journals, we're really excited about a new initiative coming out of the PKP project in uh, partnership with Stanford University to build into the PKP's open journal publishing system uh, a very simple, easy method for uh, uh, journal publishers 
to push their content into a preservation network, uh, basically a, uh, a private locks network with nodes distributed around the world. So uh, in Scholars Portal, we um, are participating both with RUD in trying to preserve the journals that, that they're uh, managing within Quebec and with PKP by hosting a, a locks uh, a locks box within our own environment and look talking with them ways that how we might be able to expose the content in those locks uh, boxes in into our preservation service. Finally on the Canadian government side uh, nine universities got together in about uh, 2012 again in partnership with Stanford uh, to build another private locks network uh, working with uh, the Internet Archives archive service to grab, uh, uh, to harvest, web harvest Canadian uh, government publications and take the resulting work files and transfer those into a, a locks, uh, p a private locks network. And again, uh, those nodes are hosted um, all across the country and there's a node in uh, Toronto as well. So, so essentially what I'm saying, I guess, about the, this national case study is that uh, each nation is going to be different in the in the uh, the proportion of material that fit these various categories, and uh, the solutions that we uh, take are going to have to be varied, both in terms of the partnerships we establish, but also the technologies we use. So not everything can be done in the big, uh, large, monolithic uh, preservation model that that suits uh, the international journals well and that Scholars Portal fits we need to build these relationships and partnerships and, and this is I think a key message of the, the Keeper's Registry as well. So uh, the previous speakers have touched upon the, the topic of open access and uh, at the ISSN International Centre we, we've set up a, a service called ROAD uh, which is the Directory of Open Access Scholarly Resources and it was set up in, in 2013 and relying on, on Peter's abilities regarding statistics, we've been able to calculate uh, that um, the, same le the same number of, of open access titles uh, are at risk of loss, uh, approximately 75% uh, yeah, of open access titles that are registered or, and, and described in road uh, in our directory uh, are at, at risk of loss. Um, so, um, we, we know that uh, there are also other, um, other resources which are um, um, concerned, not only e-journals but also conference proceedings or academic repositories. Um, so, what, what shall we do to ensure that uh, open access means uh, assured access or continuing access? We know that uh, open access has been supported by, by libraries as a whole in Canada, we've just seen it, uh, but also elsewhere in, in the world. And so it's, it's, there's a big uh, involvement of libraries uh, in support of open access. Uh, and furthermore, they've also helped in developing open access by uh, becoming uh, or by supporting publishing services. And um, we, we've seen that here uh, at the CNI, there are many presentations about um, academic repositories. Uh, there's also another player, another key player in this field and in, in the preservation and also the dissemination of open access journals, uh, which is DOAG uh, that you, you may know. And they, they've recently implemented a seal of approval um, requiring from uh, the titles they register and they promote uh, that they require first an ISSN, so we are grateful for that and uh, also the deposit with the keeper. Um, also, and uh, Alan, I've just uh, mentioned PKP, um, it's uh, important to know that uh, OJS, Open Journal System, is also used widely. Um, and uh, for example, it is used uh, by Rede Carignana in Brazil. And so it's really important that this um, system has also developed a feature um, allowing these titles to be preserved. Okay. You gather we're picking up speed just in order to get through things. Um, and uh, so in terms of conclusions, um, this is picking up again from Anne Kenny. We began with that, if you recall, referring back to 2003 and then her reprise that she did in 2015 at NACI. 
Um, and so she picked up on the various things that we can go through, but much, so the, the, there's repetition here, but there was a nice little quote that in her saying, she says, great thing called the Keeper's Registry. So we're on message together on that, and I think it's to, to see how you can connect <coughs> with what, what has been a programmatic work and the progress that's been made along the way. So what we did is uh, gather around the Keeper's Registry those who were keeping the content, the digital shelving, who after all are the real heroes of, of, of the story and the way in which they could work together. And they had a couple of meetings that we've hosted, one in, in Edinburgh, one in Paris, um, as to how they might share and, and actually not have to talk to the, the gallery, so to speak, but talk among themselves to find out how do you do this well, this exercise of, of keeping content. And um, it's attracted some endorsements um, uh, from various places across the world. And we were going to say we're looking for engagement and support from the International Alliance of uh, Research Library Associations, but um, that was breaking news, uh, Clifford, uh, uh, this morning uh, or this afternoon, that IALA, which is this combination, this relatively new association uh, or of alliances between ARL, uh, Canadian Association of Research Libraries, LIBO in Europe, um, RL UK in the UK, and the uh, Association of uh, Australian University Libraries. So that's a beginning of a group which in some sense you can reckon has stewardship of research content, research uh, stewardship uh, of scholarly record very much at its heart. And I think that's where we, we're really working together a bit with the Keepers Registry and IARA. We're also going to see how we can reach out to IFLA um, because that and the National Libraries because we're talking about material not just what is produced from scholarship but what scholarship requires again that's going out pushing necessary to how each national library but also public libraries and the rest can take this into their agenda and understand it and it's also an important aspect whereby you will have come across the UNESCO digital memory of the world perhaps uh, but that inside that is the published heritage and that's what we're trying to push the important stuff that you would have got in the research library in the print era which now you've got to make sure you still can get. So to snip through very quickly these recommendations, there are recommendations for national libraries. There aren't many in the room. Um, so these are calling to them as to how they provide leadership in various ways. And we'll be using that as we go out to IFLA to call uh, not just national libraries, but also, I suppose, national leadership groups, associations of research libraries, of other groups to go through. And then I think for research libraries, each and every library, to say what you might do. Um, so typically it's important that if the archiving agencies are doing work, they need to be, have your support. And your support comes in a variety of fashion. One is to do with give it support by way of moral support and financial support because it needs it to go on, those that need it. But also I think that within an organisation that there's a staff member who's recognised is doing that thing. And then that allows the organisation, if you're in a leadership position, that allows it to have somebody who does engage with this whole area and be able to report back what's going on. And typically, I think, also to make sure that your judgement as research librarians is to say what is important. And so one of the groups that's actually supporting the, the statement is the Ivy League Plus, uh, the development group. And we're really pleased about that because a development group is exactly the sort of people that we want to engage to say which titles are important. Um, so that the, again, the prioritization of attention. Um, so I won't go into that other than nip on to hand over again to Ted, who will see us, see us through to the end. Very quickly. Yes. Um, there's a very easy thing, and I think it comes up at the beginning where this, Ann Kenny had the article 10 years ago. It's very easy to come to the end of this and agree. We all stroke our chins and say, yes, that is a problem. Let's meet again in a year and see if it's gone away. Um, obviously, that will not work. Uh, and the goal of this, the goal of the Keeper's Registry, the goal of the Keeper's Network, the goal of Keeper's Extra Meetings is, in fact, to take action. There are things we need to do. Our attention and action have to be focused on. Uh, time for some contribution from the floor. I'm not quite sure. We may have to talk with you after the presentation because we're running on time, but we definitely do need it because this is not something those of us behind the table are going to solve on our own, not even remotely. Is that possible? Um, but we do feel there's some strategic objectives, some <coughs> targets we can agree upon, um, and some sort of division of labor we can work on. 
so very quickly. Um, this is a slide from Anne's presentation, uh, but it applies more broadly. What can NACI do? Well, what can CNI do? Because there are things CNI can do, and all these other organizations, bring the other people who do have a vested interest in this, it can raise awareness of this issue. And it is important, because it can just, it can be out of sight, out of mind. People might not even be aware of it, or it's like any number of things, it's down the bottom of your list. There is an important thing in collective act of action, the principles and the actions, and international cooperation. I think that's been crucial to the Keepers Registry. Um, and despite what I said earlier, the challenges at legal deposit nation by nation, the ability to work internationally is important because you know what, the publishers are often international, and a lot of the problems are international ones. So it is important. And so as we get to the end of this, there are things we would like to see that can be done and should be done by the time we're back here in Washington next December. We really do need to tackle the long tail. There, we want at least 20 academic libraries who provide the keepers with priority titles of e-publications. It is very easy for the academic libraries now to think, um, because it is work to maintain those e-connections. And they are putting resources, and that is crucial. But on the other hand, they still have a role in this sort of preservation side. And identifying those priority titles is crucial. But they must provide it. They're the ones on the ground with the ideas. Get it to us. We can't save it if we don't know it exists. You know it exists. Let us know. Because uh, we'd like each keeper to have acquired at least 20 journals published by small publishers. We like getting the big publishers, but we feel guilty because the small publishers are the ones that are at risk and they are just as valuable. It will give a very poor image of the published heritage if all we do is collect the big stuff. That will be skewed and that will be wrong for any scholar. Um, we want to significantly increase the keep safe ratio. A keeper's badge, which will be designed by Peter himself, um, awarded to publishers who invest their kind of at least three keepers. I thought I was thinking about that earlier. You want it in multiple places. The Titanic had four watertight containers and it still did not work for it. Let us hope that three keepers, however, should be what we absolutely require. Keep it safe in all of us. Um, and just increase the support of the keepers, the keepers registry. Double the number of research libraries active. Come and talk to us. We are not selling you a timeshare. We are not trying to sign you up to something where you have to go back and cry in front of your management because you signed your name to something. You can help us in ways which are not going to put you in a bad spot. You're going to help us so we can help you. And this will all ensure that these publications, which are valuable to researchers, to faculty, students now, and for generations to come, will be preserved. And then very quickly, because I'm probably over, um, there are just a few key propositions underneath this whole thing. Um, assigning an identifier to the point of issue. Some way of identifying it. Tag it. Ensure that it is archived routinely. And preferably have others do so as well. As I said, three is good. Four is better, but three is really good. Um, and say for archiving institutions, say what you're doing. There are, as I said, the five national uh, institutions which are keepers. There are more doing the same thing. Say what you're doing so we know this is being preserved. Say what you're doing so we can try and work collaboratively in ways that will reach economies of scale, divisions of labor as possible while still maintaining the keep safe ratio. And publish the terms of access. This is interesting and challenging, but it is important. One of the challenges we find is um, you may have it, I may have it, someone else may have it, but what can you do with it? And it makes it difficult to do, reach that collaboration until we know those things as well. And with that, I think we're okay. at the very end. So yes, I think we have reached the end. So uh, I apologize that we haven't left much time for questioning. And I apologize <laughs> we hadn't rehearsed sufficiently. But let's open the floor to questions that there might be.